Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 30th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we follow up on a couple of recent articles in the press by discussing what is happening with Cook Inlet gas. Second, we pick up on a piece in the Alaska Beacon to discuss where the PFD may be headed next. And third, we explain why, although there continues to be a lot of discussion about ANWR, all of the money is heading away from it. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started. Um, first things first, you're going to talk with us a bit about what's going on with Cook Inlet Gas. Now, we've heard a few things about this, how some of the gas suppliers are saying, hey, don't count on us in the future because we're worried about things. And then, of course, there was a story in the AP this morning about how NSTAR got sold to another place, try something or other out of Canada. There seems to be a lot of moving and shaking going on with South Central Gas. So what's happening and what is the effect going to be? Well, it's it's interesting. We went through this about a decade ago uh, when uh, uh, the Cook Inlet was transitioning from Marathon and Chevron. Marathon, and before that, it had been Unical, and then Chevron bought Unical uh, to Hillcorp. And before that transition occurred, both Marathon and Chevron were raising concerns about Cook Inlet gas supplies. Um, it turned out that issue was much more about deliverability. There, there's two things you worry about in gas supply. One is, especially in an area like Alaska, uh, which has a, 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 a dominant winter coal or winter peak. Uh, one is your annual supply. Uh, and the second is your deliverability, your ability to deliver uh, on peak. And what we were concerned about a decade ago was more peak supply, the ability of the Cook Inlet to deliver into the pipeline system that supports both NSTAR and the electric uh, power generation uh, uh, system in uh, South Central. We were concerned about deliverability on peak. Um, and that got solved uh, in a couple of ways. One, uh, well, it got solved in one primary way. NSTAR built a new gas storage facility down right. in Cook Inlet. Right down near down near Kenai and what that enabled them to do was to take a lot of summer gas that otherwise was shut in frankly because there isn't demand in the summer put it into storage and then bring it out of storage in the winter uh, and add supplement of uh, the supply that was coming from uh, from the production wells right um, and that really solved that that solved the problem that we were facing at the time at the same time uh, Hillcorp acquired Marathon and Chevron and had, did a you know reduced costs because that's what Hillcorp does um, by, by reducing employee count and other things, but reduced costs increase the the economics of going after some additional supplies that Chevron and Marathon hadn't, um, and increase the overall the overall supply of gas uh, coming out of the inlet relative to where it was headed with Chevron and Marathon. So those two things really solved those two steps really solved the the problem that we were facing a decade ago. It looks like we're going right back into it. And the thing that they're going back into another phase of it. And the thing that is that is uh, interesting about that is at a presentation late last week uh, at Governor Dunleavy's Renewable uh, Energy Conference, uh, Luke Sawyer, who is the, the Senior Vice President for Alaska of Hillcorp, had this to say. 
you should buy less of my gas. Now, this is this is the head of Hillcorp in Alaska. <laughs> you should buy less of my gas. We should have other supplies of energy in the Cook Inlet. Uh, part of the reason is the need to address climate change, he said, and part is simple reservoir reality. Cook Inlet has enough gas supply, supply for about the next five years to avoid concerns about rolling brownouts, he said, but the future is less secure. What we want to make sure of is it's that five, six years from now, there is no crisis of natural gas, and that means we need to move with some urgency as a community to diversify our sources of supply. That's the senior vice president of Hillcorp. The, 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 the status in the Cook Inlet right now is that Hillcorp is by far the dominant supplier. There are some other much smaller oil and gas companies that contribute some, but, but Hillcorp is, after having acquired Chevron and Marathon's interest, Hillcorp and ConocoPhillips' interest um, in the Cook Inlet, uh, Chevron or Hillcorp is the big supplier in the Cook Inlet. So if they're telling people not to count on us, uh, that's a little concerning. And as he says, it's not, it's not an immediate issue, but, but you know, if, they're, if they don't renew contracts that are supply contracts that go to NSTAR and go to the South Central Electric Utilities, that's a big concern. Um, so I, it's, something that we, it's something that we need to start you know, looking at, taking into account. 10 years ago, when we had this problem, a decade ago, when we had this problem, all sorts of things were going on. We had the, the mayor, then Dan Sullivan, uh, appointed a, a special commission that started looking at you know, alternatives for how we were going to deal with brownouts and Dade. Indeed, went into, a, had, a, had a, a whole series, a, a whole uh, a protocol for how we were going to deal with uh, shortages of gas supplies in the Cook Inlet. Um, and uh, we had uh, a number of other responses that, uh, that occurred at that time. So it's, it's something that uh, it, uh, I remember sitting in one meeting at that, uh, during that period where we were talking about uh, taking the Kenai uh, LNG plant, reversing it, uh, and so it was able to accept LNG rather than exporting LNG, um, and looking at uh, bringing in LNG to, uh, to the cooking line. So it's, it's, it's an issue that we, that we hit about a decade ago. We found solutions to in terms of, in terms of meeting deliverability with increased storage. And in terms of Hillcorp coming in and, and scraping rocks deeper, better than Chevron and Marathon had more rocks, maybe is a better way to put it, uh, than Chevron and Marathon had and, and maintaining gas supplies that way. But, you know, if Hillcorp's raising the alarm, it's a legitimate alarm and something that, uh, that we need to be uh, we need to be looking at. So what, what are our, you know, what are the, the major options for, uh, you know, for, for replacing that? I mean, do we pull it off the North Slope? Well, I mean... What are, what are the next, you know, what are the next closest choices other than what the reversal of what you were just talking about there? Well, um, one choice that was promoted at the Governor's Renew, uh, Renewable Energy Conference is renewable energy, more renewable energy, uh, tidal energy, hydro energy, uh, uh, wind energy, uh, and bringing more renewable supplies, solar energy, um, uh, and bringing more renewable supplies onto the South Central grid. And indeed, the South Central Utilities have announced an upgrade to the, that they're going to invest in an upgrade uh, to the uh, South Central electric transmission system to try to accommodate additional renewable uh, supplies. Um, another option is increased exploration in the Cook Inlet, uh, dealing with it by additional supplies. There's a real problem with the Cook Inlet, though. It's, it's, a, it's a very small market. And so if you go out and spend a bunch of month, a bunch of money exploring for gas and find a bunch of gas, there's really no place to go with it. Hillcorp's got all the contracts to the, to the utilities locked in. Um, there might be opportunities as Hill, if, if Hillcorp, in fact, starts backing out of the Cook Inlet. But it really, it's tough to get investment into new exploration uh, into the Cook Inlet. Um, and then the third option, and frankly, the, uh, the, the, the third and fourth options are either bring in LNG to the South Central or build a gas line. And frankly, the more economic of those two options, unless you have an export market for the gas line, the more economic of those op two options is to bring LNG uh, into the Cook Inlet, to, to use the, the Kenai LNG facility and, uh, and bring LNG into the, into the Cook Inlet. So it's not, it's not like we're going to go you know, it's not like we're going to suddenly be, you know, have no natural gas in the, in, in the, in the inlet. Um, but, but we need to be looking at, at the other options and start considering uh, uh, what those, 
how we how we follow through uh, on those other options. So do we import LNG from other markets or do we ship it down from the North Slope? Do we liquefy it up there, bring tankers around? I mean, what's the what's the better option there? Well, we <laughs> there's been a lot of studies about uh, about building LNG facilities on the North Slope. Uh, the whole problem, the, the the big problem is the shallowness of the of the of the ocean up there, uh, and the ability to get tankers uh, tankers in and out. Um, and, and the historic problem has also been ice. Um, so have, dealing with those two issues, no one's ever solved uh, those two issues. Uh, building a line down from the slope uh, is just you know, huge economic cost. Right. I mean, we, we've talked about the, you know, the 40 or 40 or 40 billion dollars. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's likely higher now because of inflation that's going on in the in the construction markets. Um, so that's just a huge economic cost. And for a very small market, even if you pick up Fairbanks on the way, uh, it's just for a very small smart market like South Central that the economics just don't work. So we're fortunate. We're fortunate in that we do have I mean, the ultimate fallback is the LNG facility, the LNG import facility. And we're fortunate in that we have that. Uh, Tesoro bought it, now Marathon bought it, uh, and converted it to bring uh, LNG in. So it's sitting there uh, in a mode where it could be used uh, to bring in LNG. That LNG presumably would come from the same place that, that Asian LNG is coming from, uh, the U.S. Gulf Coast or uh, for elsewhere. Uh, but uh, that's, sort of, that's, that's sort of what our, what our options are. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. All right, so it's something to look for on the horizon. We'll be, I'm sure this will be a topic of conversation over the next uh, year or two at least uh, before we come up with some kind of decision. What is the source of Anchorage's gas? We talked about that a little bit. That's the Cook Inlet for the most part. Uh, Charlie's asking that. Uh, that's where the lion's share is still coming from the Cook Inlet, right? Oh, it all comes from the Cook Inlet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's also the source of Fairbanks's gas. I mean, one of the interesting things to sort of think about here is Fairbanks is building up all this infrastructure to, hand, to have natural gas deliveries in Fairbanks. That's all based on the Cook Inlet. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean some people have talked about running a, a very small line down from the North Slope down to Fairbanks. That's hugely expensive on a, on a per unit basis. Um, so what's really happened is, is, is they've developed an LNG system to bring gas up from the Cook Inlet. That's dependent on the Cook Inlet. So if the right. Cook Inlet's going to have gas supply issues, I mean, theoretically, what what you do is you shrink. We sort of went back. We went through this in the in the 1970s when we had gas supply shortages nationally. Nationally, you prioritize those uses that don't have alternate. So presumably, you shrink the gas supply would focus on NSTAR and focus on uh, gas used for heating, uh, and then you would find alternate uses. That's why there's the, the focus on renewables for the for the electric side. Right. Uh, but, but right now, uh, most of the predominant share of South Central's, all of South Central's gas supply used for home heating, all of all of Fairbanks' gas supply used for home heating, um, and a predominant share of the gas supply used to power generation uh, is coming from the Cook Inlet. Well, the irony of that is, of course, I was part of that whole thing when they developed the authority and did all those things, things that I was... Uh, adamantly against is because we saw what happened they delivered gas into fairbanks but then they charged just a few pennies less of what it would cost to heat your home with other methods um and it was not universally accepted obviously they invested millions of dollars they put they ran gas pipes out by my house in north pole i mean they were like we're all this is all going to be here tomorrow now that was almost 10 years ago so i mean it's just uh, you know I don't know if it's a pipe dream or not, but good luck. You're not going to see the same price for gas in Fairbanks that you're going to see down anywhere else. Uh, it would have to make fiscal sense. And at this point, I'm not sure that it does. 45 seconds, Brad. Well, uh, uh, the Cook Inlet, the Cook Inlet's a, a key player in, uh, in South Central Energy. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to be focusing on this over the next, uh, over the next, uh, at least a couple of years. Let's move on to, uh, Number two, which is the future of the PFD. Uh, we got about uh, four or five minutes here that we could talk about that. We could split it up into two, Brad, if we need to. But let's uh, let's talk about what you see as the future of the PFD now that we've settled out this year. Where does it go from here? Well, there was an interesting article in the uh, Alaska Beacon, which is the new uh, news source uh, <laughs> founded by 
founded by, uh, uh, as a nonprofit, uh, headed by Andrew Kitchenman, who used to be with uh, Alaska Public Media and has James Brooks and others as writers. Um, and it was, the headline of the story is, Legislators Ponder Next Step for PFD After One of the Biggest in History. I hate that headline. I hate, I hate the one of the biggest in history. It, it, it wasn't even, it so, wasn't anywhere close to a statutory PFD. Right. Um, and it, and it wasn't, it, it didn't even reach a POMB 5050 when you look at, when you look at over uh, the FY22 and FY23 uh, combined, which is how the legislature sort of dealt with the budget this last session. Um, and so, you know, it, it, yes, in terms of nominal amount, it may be one of the biggest in history, uh, but in terms of meeting the statutory obligation or meeting even the POMB 5050 objective, it isn't that. Uh, but, but Kitchenman's article is about, you know, what, what, where does it go next after, uh, after this? And I, and, you know, he, he, interviews various people, including uh, Representative Prox that says, you know, now that we have, now that we've had a higher PFD that sets the standard for future PFDs and, and, uh, and others on the other side, including Senator Stedman that, uh, that, uh, that, that feel differently uh, from that. I think the, I think the answer is really in this election, it, it, the answer is we don't know uh, until we get through this election cycle uh, with a third of the, of the legislators, uh, third of the legislative seats up for, up for grabs, either legislators not running again uh, or, uh, or, you know, redistricted open seats uh, with a third of a, with a third of the legislature in that mode, either, either legislative, the, the incumbents not running or open seats. Uh, there's going to be a huge turnover in the legislature and that doesn't even take into account the potential for, uh, you know, upsets uh, with incumbents being defeated. So, right. Uh, we're, we're not, I don't think we're really going to know what the, and, and then we got a governor's race. We don't really know what's going to happen uh, until, until we have a governor who, uh, who outlines the, uh, the way forward. I do think that, that the, the, the pro PFD, the uh, continue to follow the statute, or at least no less than, than POMB 5050. I think those forces remain strong. I think we saw how strong they were uh, certainly in the Senate, uh, with the votes this session, uh, I don't think that I don't think those forces are going away. But at the same token, you know, the 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 combination of the progressives who want big government and the top twenty percent who don't want to pay for it, uh, uh, those forces which have combined to uh, you know uh, force PFD cuts in the last uh, last several sessions, those forces remain uh, strong as well. My hope. Is that is that we have candidates uh, through this legislative through this through these legislative races who are elected and go into office next year, who are committed to talk about uh, uh, intent on pursuing uh, the, uh, the 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 resolution talked about by the fiscal uh, fiscal policy working group, the legislature's fiscal policy working group that came out. Last year really didn't get much traction in this legislature, right? But I think, but I think, well defines the way forward. And my hope is that we have candidates who pick up on that, run on that uh, as a solution to the PFD, and take office next year uh, committed to that. And that, and that, the the fiscal policy working group outline includes a commitment to a constitutionalized um, uh, 50, 50, POMB fifty fifty PF, PFD. So game this out for us, Brad. I mean, if we get somebody, uh, if we get, and as we said, 59 of 60 seats are open, a good third of those, either the incumbent is retired or there's a good chance for an upset. What does that mean? If 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 we get people in there who are more pro-PFD, pro-public or, you know, private sector spend versus the pro-government spend, uh, we've got some options. If not... Uh, does the PFD last? Does it exist? Does it get does it get subsumed by the government spending? What you know, play it out for me here. Well, if we get enough people in the legislature to do something about it, what we need to focus on is to constitutionalize the PFD. Because as long as as the fiscal policy working group recommended, as long as it's subject to uh, legislative uh, uh, fiat or legislative discretion. Uh, it's always going to be a bouncing ball. I mean, it'll it'll be sort of be like Anwar, right? It'll be one some years it'll be high when there's when there's pro legislators legislators supportive of it and when revenues are high. Other years it'll be low when we have governors like Walker or we have legislators in there who, you know, uh, either want high you know, want high government spending but don't want the top twenty percent to pay a share of it. 
Um, so it'll keep bouncing, bouncing back and forth. It won't be a reliable contribution to the private sector or, or a reliable country contribution to, uh, to Alaska families. And we need, and, and to fix that, we need to put something, we need to put a PFD fix in the constitution. That's what the, that's what the focus needs to be. Um, if we don't, uh, if we don't get that done, uh, uh, I, over the next 10 years, we're just going to have continual battles. And, and, and the battle is going to be the same as we've, as we've had it uh, over, the, uh, over the past uh, decade or since, well, 20, past half decade, since 2016. The battle is going to be those who want to spend, uh, want, those who think that the PFD should be used to spend, to support government spending, and uh, the top 20% who don't want to pay for government spending, and so they want to use the PFD to do it. Uh, push the cost down on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's going to be that against the other side, which believes that the PFD, that there are revenues to support the PFD. The statute says they come from the earnings. The earnings are, have, have produced enough to support the PFD over even the last half decade. There's going to be those who continue to push that and either call for lower government, lower government spending uh, uh, down to the levels that where you don't need supplemental revenues uh, or, uh, or those who say, okay, if you're going to need supplemental revenues, let's make them equitable across the board. Uh, all Alaska families contribute to the, to the cost of government. So it's going to be, there's, there's going to be that sort of tension. I don't think the PFD disappears in that tension, but I think the PFD stays low, um, lower than, lower than the statute, lower than uh, POMV 50, 50. It, it's just, it's just it ties you up every year trying to deal with, uh, trying to deal with uh, the PFD if we don't, if we don't get it resolved. Well, and that leads me to a bigger question before we get into number three. Um, you know, the, the question that uh, a lot of us are asking about the constitutional convention. Um, I have not been a fan of that, but I've come to realize that because of the lack of political will, it may be the only thing that at least forces or puts more pressure on the legislature. I mean, in and of itself, it may not fix the problem if the legislature fixes it in the meanwhile because they see the pressure of the con con uh have your thoughts changed on that at all i know that you were very hesitant to dive into that because of the opportunity that it presents for others to uh, meddle with the constitution what's your current thought on that now based on what's just happened well i i'm still concerned about uh, about how that plays out about how a constitutional convention uh, plays out in terms of in terms of the issues uh, I still think uh, that we haven't seen the real force that's going to be behind a constitutional convention, uh, which is going to come if Roe versus Wade is, is, is overturned uh, this summer. The issue goes back to the states. I think there's going to be a real push uh, for a constitutional convention in Alaska, frank, frankly, to deal with the right to privacy uh, provision in the Alaska Constitution and try to you know, lower the state's uh, uh, limits on, uh, on, on abortion. So, um, or, or increase the state's barriers to abortion. So I, I, I think the con con is going to stay out there as an issue. I, I just, I, I continue to be concerned about, uh, about the, 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 just the reopening the whole thing uh, across the board. I continue to be concerned about what is, whether that's a realistic solution to the PFD. I mean, we talked, we walked through the, the timeline before it, it's another election before we have this election. We said we want a con con, then it's another election before we elect delegates to the CONCON. Then, then we have then those delegates have to come to some sort of solution. And given the way this state split on a whole lot of issues, I'm not sure they ever get to a solution. And the and the PFD just sort of keeps you know being bounced around in the meantime. I would much prefer to have the legislature address the PFD to have candidates election elected this cycle that address the that that are committed to addressing the PFD as part of a long term fiscal plan that go into the legislature next year and, and, and deal with the PFD in that way. I don't know. It's, it's, it, I, it, like you, I remain somewhat ambivalent on, uh, on the con con, uh, uh, you know, you, I, I've tried to make an argument, argument to myself that passing a con con voting for a con con doesn't necessarily mean we're going to change the constitution. It does, it does put more pressure on next year's legislature to find solutions to the, the PFD and other constitutional issues and, and try to you know, limit the, the exposure before we get into a full constitutional convention. Um, I, it, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be an issue that, that we're gonna have to think about more, I think, as, uh, as we go through, uh, go through the fall. 
Hawk says, I heard the PFD money is coming out in July. Is that true? Um, I don't know. The governor pushed the PFDs up last year uh, because of the fiscal need. And I, I certainly think there's probably still a fiscal need in the state of people dealing with post-pandemic economics and everything else. It's possible. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I know that there was some discussion around that going around. There were some rumors, but Brad, have you heard anything about an early release of the PFD? No, Michael, I haven't. Uh, I, I, you know, there was, there was some discussion about dividing it. I mean, the governor, I think at one time proposed dividing it between a spring PFD uh, as a supplement to the FY22 budget and as the regular PFD in the FY23 budget. I would be a little surprised to tell you the truth. I mean, one of the things, the, the, the timing of the PFD is, is historically the, the, the justification for it is to get people ready for winter. It comes in October, people get you buy it, you know, buy their winter supplies, buy their winter supply of fuel, buy, you know, goods for winter, whatever, whatever uh, uh, you, you buy in bulk for winter. That's the historic justification of it. The side justification of it is, is it comes a month before the election uh, and is a good reminder for <laughs> at least for incumbents. Right, right. Uh, Look what we did about, for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And with the governor uh, facing a race, uh, uh, a, diff, uh, a challenging race, uh, you would think uh, this coming year, uh, you would think that 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 motivation of having it come out in October uh, might be might be the predominant one. I I don't know. I you know he he I assume that he could distribute it earlier. The statute calls for it uh, in October. I I. I, I don't I'm probably there may be authorities that, that that allow him to give it earlier, but I would be surprised. I would be surprised. Yeah, he did this last go around. I know that it was part. They said it was within his purview to release it at early on when he did it in July. I guess it was last year uh, or was it 2020? I guess it was last year. He released it early. Um, so I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. Uh, maybe they break it up and said uh, maybe they break it up and do the PFD in June, July, and and the energy relief in uh, October. I mean, who knows? Who knows at this point? It's you, all speculation. You, you wouldn't want to do that because then you'd you'd have two administrative costs. I mean, that's there, true. There are there are administrative costs in getting in 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 processing and and getting this money out. So you, you really you really wouldn't want to try to break it into two pieces. Yeah, Donna Arduin says forty million dollars in administrative costs when you put out the dividend. So, yeah, you definitely don't want to be doing that twice uh, for that kind of stuff. All right, this takes us up to number three, the word uh, Anwar. In fact, one of the headlines in the ADN this morning uh, reads, oil drilling in Anwar faces long odds. It's still dividing progressives in the Alaska House race because you're seeing a lot of progressives still saying, yes, we need to drill in Anwar. Uh, what uh, What is your take on what's happening with Anwar now? Where does it go in the future? Well, we talk a lot about Anwar. And, and it's a very divisive issue uh, uh, in, in some quarters. But frankly, we're wasting our time. <laughs> uh, there was a, Nat Hertz did what I think was, a, was an excellent story in the, uh, in the ADN a few days back. Uh, the title of it is, Two Oil Companies Quietly Spent $10 Million to Exit Arctic Refuge uh, Leases. And what he's talking about was a, was a recent disclosure in uh, ASRC's annual report, uh, ASRC actually owns some of the mineral estate over in uh, over in the Anwar area, and ASRC had entered into leases a long time ago with Chevron and BP. Uh, BP subsequently uh, signed its interest to Hillcorp uh, at the time of the acquisition. Um, had entered into leases a long time ago for Anwar. In the event Anwar ever got opened, a ASRC. Uh, wanted to push those leases, push development on their leases as well as on the on the federal leases, and the story reports on a on, on an entry in the ASRC annual report uh, indicating that both Chevron and Hillcorp paid ASRC to get out of those leases, uh, to terminate uh, those leases, and the concern that both companies had, I would imagine, is this. Uh, leases, when you have a lease, you have an obligation to go forward and, and, and drill on and develop the lease if it's economic. Right. Um, but you have an obligation to, to, to drill on the lease. That's part of the obligation that comes with the lease. And with, and with the federal government going back and forth with ANWR, 
uh, I think both Hillcorp and uh, and and now Hillcorp and Chevron were confronting a situation where ASRC might be able to force them to to drill uh, on Anwar uh, duty to on perform the, on the right ARC Anwar leases right that's the duty to perform function of the clause of their contracts or their leases right so I I think what what happened there was uh, that that both Hillcorp and Chevron paid money to terminate the leases to get out of the obligation to uh, to drill the, the money you know a lot of people are talking about getting into anwar all the money is running away from anwar we we saw it when the federal government had the leases open and and you know and and put the leases out there that that the only bidder on those leases was a state entity the ada uh, the industrial uh, development and export authority uh, uh, was the only bidder on those leases. Private companies, none of them wanted to come in and, and bid on those. Nobody believes, I mean, even if Anwar is open for a moment, even if, you know, we get another Trump administration or another Republican administration that opens them for a moment, it's going to be followed by another Democrat administration that'll close them again. And nobody believes you're going to, you're ever going to be able to realize anything on the investment. So we talk a lot about Anwar, but, but look at the money, follow the money, and all the money is running away from Anwar. It's not running into Anwar or yeah. not getting ready to go into Anwar. Right. Um, and, and all this talk we have about it is just sort of, to me, a waste of time. You had a quote in that article uh, where you said, there may be oil in Anwar, there may be a lot of it, but no one is the faith that the federal government reliably will let it be developed and produced. Um, and that's really the main part here, right, is the federal government you know, oh, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I mean, it's, it's you know, it definitely doesn't give investors uh, a good uh, sound feeling in their belly when they see that kind of stuff coming up out of that. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing over at NPRA. I mean, NPRA expand, uh, expands, contracts, expands, contracts. I mean, it's just, you know, people think if we can just get another Republican administration in there, we'll get Anwar open and we'll have oil development. No, you won't. And the reason you won't is because it takes a long time to, to, to determine that there's oil in there, to find the oil, uh, to develop the oil, to build the infrastructure around getting the oil out. Uh, and within that period of time, you're going to have another administration that's going to close it back. And, and no one is going to make the investment, no reasonable investor, not, not, a, not a public company, not a private investor, no one's going to make the investment to go in there and and develop uh, uh, develop those resources when you're going to be subject to that sort of shuffling. I mean, look at look at Conoco, the Willow prospect, big prospect, great prospect, tremendous pop prospect. Uh, they've got they, they leased it, they found the oil, they're putting oil in there, and now they're being delayed probably two years, maybe more, uh, on on the fact that the EIA has to be redone because the Trump administration, frankly, rammed it through as quick as they could, but not as carefully as they could, and left holes open in it for uh, for judicial challenge. And so, you know, Conoco's got it all sitting there. They found it. They discovered it. They know what they're going to do. They have the plan for it. Can't start on it. Can't get to it uh, because of the delays from the NPRA. And time is money. I mean, Conoco could be putting the money they put into that someplace else. So it's the, 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 the challenge here. I mean, we can talk a lot about developing about developing Anwar, we can talk a lot about you know the potential out in NPRA, uh, in, in farther out in NPRA, but but convincing investors to put money into into those uh, situations is just uh, we, we we talk about it we we talk about it a lot more than there's money to support uh, talking about it. Right. Well, uh, and unfortunately, of course, it is the wealth in Alaska, and it would, uh, you know, would bring more wealth to the to the uh, to the state and and do well for us. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a trillion cubic square f- square feet of gas up there on the North Slope too, but we can't seem to get at that either. I mean, this whole thing is the irony is that we are a resource rich state that seems to be starving ourselves out at every opportunity. We are a very resource rich rich state, but the resources are way the heck out there. And and getting them developed and getting them to market is a is a huge uh, economic challenge, a huge commercial challenge. And I and I think <clears throat> this discussion that has been had in the past about whether the state should be the main player in that, I don't know. It's 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 not the state's place to do that. I mean, I'm you know all I have to do is look at a DMV or a post office and say exactly how efficient government can be in the way that it does things. The idea that government can go in there and create. Uh, 
you know, whether it's pipelines or tanking systems or whatever else, I'm very skeptical that that could be run efficiently to the point of where it could even be economic or even, you know, that it wouldn't eventually eat up everything else that's going on. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a supporter of of the state perhaps co-investing, looking at co-investment opportunities with 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 private leads to help, you know, make the economics of a of a project work, to help provide a source of, of funds. But but under private sector lead, co-investing with private sector lead. The the concern I have, the concern I have with the the what Ada did at uh, at the at, at Anwar with with taking those leases, the concern I had with uh, with with Walker's LNG proposal, uh, once he sort of ditched Exxon and, and BP, uh, was you know it's it, it's the state and the lead, and you're absolutely right. I mean, DMV, you can you can think of other examples of of state led projects that that really that really don't go anyplace. Um, so co investing, I want to I want to hold open the option of co investing with uh, uh, with private sector in the development of Alaska's resources if that's if that's helpful. But but state led projects just uh, to me just are you know, it's, it's a it's just another way of wasting money. It's just another way of saying we're doing something, talking about it uh, without actually having the ability to uh, deliver on it. Uh, Brad, final thoughts here as we wrap things up. We're about two minutes out, so I got about ninety seconds here. So uh, your final thoughts for today as we get ready to close for the uh, filing deadline and everything else. Any final thoughts? Good luck. <laughs> To everybody who's who's thinking about it, um, uh, and uh, and and hopefully we will have additional candidates because right now we don't have enough we don't have enough uh, 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 candidates to uh, to pass a PFD constitutional amendment. So if anybody's out there thinking about running uh, uh, in their in their for their legislative seat, do it. Uh, yeah, and uh, and get out there and make the case for it. I mean, every every person who's running for office should have a challenger, even if that's just to keep them sharp at this point. Uh, even if they are pro PFD, we definitely need uh, um, we definitely need it tomorrow again. Five p.m. is the deadline for filing. Uh, we've seen some people step up to the plate. Uh, uh, I'm thinking specifically of Kelly Nash and Bart LeBond's seat, but we need more. Uh, we need more folks stepping up there to where we could get that political will we keep talking about um, to make the changes that are necessary. Uh, but again, putting the PFD out of reach of the politicians should be priority number one. It should. It should to, to, to get, you know, any sort of fiscal solution, that has to be taken off the table. That has to be put in the Constitution. Then we can deal with getting everything else uh, uh, brought together. Yeah. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. My friend, thank you so much for coming on board as usual. Um, it's good to talk with you. I hope you had a great weekend. I did, Michael. Thanks for having me, as, as always, and look forward to talking to you again next week. All right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.